Hey, so this morning, um, well, last week Grace was talking about glasses, and uh, this morning I've also got a glasses story. It's not mine though, because I don't wear glasses. I have perfect 2020 vision. That's right, no defect in my eyes at all. Perfect sight. So, um, but this story involves one of my friends. His name is Ryan, and I've known Ryan for like since we were five. My first memory of Ryan was when we were at kids' church. And we all had to write our names on like a banner for our year level. And there was this one girl that Ryan didn't like and he crossed her name out. Yeah, that's my first memory of Ryan. I know, he was just like, watch this. And then he just like drew a line through her name. What a terrible person. Nah, he's a great guy. But this story involved Ryan's glasses. Ryan has always had glasses for as long as I can remember. And uh, Ryan... He had a pair of glasses from when he was about 10 to when he was about 14 that had a very special feature. Have you ever wanted to have glasses that can glow in the dark? Yes. Yes, I'm sure someone does. But no, why would you want that feature? But here's the best part. Ryan's glasses had that feature. But Ryan didn't know. So he did not know at all that his glasses would glow in the dark. Now, for the most, like the majority of the time, this was not an issue at all. The only time it became an issue was when we were playing hide and seek. Yeah, you can imagine what happens. I'm counting, you know, one, two, three, four, kind of like, you know, counting for Peter's push-ups, but I'm counting And I get to 10, and then it's like, all right, let's go find Ryan in this room with all of these other people. Now, everyone else could be hiding really badly, but Ryan would be hiding. And all you would see were these two floating circles in the dark. Because obviously his glasses were glowing. Now, we didn't tell Ryan about this for years because it was the easiest thing in the world to know that no matter how well anyone had hidden, you would find Ryan because his glasses would be glowing in the dark. You'd walk into a room, you'd look under the bed, two little circles would look back at you. Hey, Ryan. And he's like, oh, how did you find me? I don't know, just a good guess. You know, like, because you couldn't let on that his glasses were glowing because then he would take them off. Anyway, Eventually, one day, um, you know, we were playing... You you guys know sardines? Yeah, Yeah, you know the one where one person hides and everyone's got to find them? Well, all of us had hidden really, really well, and so it took each other a long time to find them. But Ryan went to hide, and everyone found him in like three minutes. Again, because there were just these floating circles in the middle of one of the rooms. You know, well, there's Ryan, and everyone found him really quickly. He's like, why does everyone find me so quick? Why am I nearly always the first one found in hide and seek? Why am I nearly always so quickly found in sardines? I, just, I feel like I get good hiding spots, and people find me really quick. And eventually we decided, you know what, we should tell him. And so someone said, hey, Ryan, the reason this happens is because you have glow-in-the-dark glasses. He said, what? He said, yeah, your glasses glow in the dark. So every time you hide in the dark, all of a sudden we we see two floating circles in the middle of any room. He's like, oh, man, I didn't know. And so he was like so disappointed. But Ryan's problem was he doesn't have great eyesight. So if he took his glasses off and then tried to find a place to hide in the dark, you would hear where he went because he'd be like bang into this and then, you know, walk into that, little owl over here. Because he just couldn't see very well. So he was stuck in this awkward situation. But it was interesting because we loved that we could see Ryan's glasses. We loved that there was light coming from Ryan's glasses because it made it easy for us to find him. Anytime you wanted to see Ryan, you would just look for the glowing circles. But Ryan hated the light because it felt like it exposed him. It felt like it showed people where he was. It felt like it showed people where he was hiding. And so he hated the fact that he had the light. He did get clever towards the end. He would take his glasses off and put them in different spots. So you'd be like, oh! And he'd be like, oh no, that's a dresser, not Ryan. You know, he's just left his glasses on there, which was clever. But Ryan didn't really like the light that came from his glasses. But we loved the light that came from his glasses. And I think for each of us, if you were honest, 
we would all have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with the light. I mean, some of you just hate the fact that your parents come in in the morning and they flick the lights on before you're really awake. How much does that suck? You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, it's so bright. Why are you doing this to me? You know, like now I have to go to school. You know, like all of the things that come with the lights being turned on. But at the same time, we also really enjoy the light because let's be real, all the best things happen during the day. Like, yeah, serious, I'm gonna be honest. Any one of you who are like, no, the best things happen at night, they don't. I can tell you why. You're gonna get married in the day. No, I've never been to a night wedding. The reception happens at night, but the wedding ceremony itself happens during the day. Did someone say, who said I'm getting married? Yeah, Mate, you say that now. You say that now. But when you're 21, you'll be coming to me and going, then why am I still single? Why am I still single? I just want to get married. Just you wait. Just you wait. Seriously, it happens all the time. But all of the best things happen during the day. I genuinely believe that. And here's why. Because that's when you can do the most things. There's so many things that you cannot do at night. Because either things aren't open, either things aren't safe, or it's just not a viable option to do. And let's be real, a lot of terrible things, yeah, they can happen during the day, but why are we more afraid of the dark than we are of the light? Like, I think that kind of like rests his point. Did anyone here have a night light for when they were in their bedroom during the day? No. But did you have a night light in your bedroom at night, hands in the air? Anyone have a night light because you were scared of the dark? There's no shame in that. Anyone still have a night light? Peter, Peter, put your hand up. Peter, took, Peter told me he's still scared of the dark. It's fine, Peter. It's fine. We can't all be like emotionally strong as well as physically strong. But seriously, like, if you think about it, you get scared of the dark. You know, you feel like bad things happen. You know, that's where you hear the stories of some man got punched and, you know, he fell on the ground and died at 2 a.m. in the morning. You know, like those things tend to happen. When you think of someone robbing a house, what do you think of? You don't think they did it during the day. You presume it happened during the night. When bad things happen, we tend to presume they've happened at night. They've happened in the dark. And we get it, right? Because for each and every one of you, you want all your best things, all the things that you're most proud of to happen in front of people. You want the light to shine on you when you have just successfully scored your first hat-trick at soccer. You want everyone to know about it. You hope everyone saw it. But there's probably a whole lot of things that you hope never see the light of day. You hope that no one ever finds out what you really think of yourself. You hope that no one ever finds out what you look at behind closed doors. You hope no one ever finds out about the thing that you said about that person behind their back. There are things that you want to keep hidden. So you don't go and show them to everyone. You don't want the spotlight on you then. You want those things to stay in the dark, to stay hidden. And so for all of us, we have a love-hate relationship with the light. There's certain things we want everyone to know. There's certain things we want to keep a secret. All the best things happen during the day. All the shady things seem to happen at night. And for us, as we go through our Who Am I series, we're looking at something that's a little bit abstract about who we are as people who follow Jesus. If you're a Christian in the room this morning, this is a little bit about who we are. If you're not, this is an invitation about what's available to you because of what Jesus has done for you. But to do that, we're going to look at Ephesians. We've been going through Ephesians in all this, uh, this whole series. And today we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 to 14 in the NIV. If you uh, have your Bibles on your phone, feel free to get them out and read along with me. But otherwise, I'm going to read it from the screen. Well, I'm going to read it from my iPad and it's going to be on the screen. So here it says, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 
See, Paul is trying to make a very clear point about who we are as Christians, who we are as followers of Christ. He's contrasting light and darkness. Because what Paul wants you to understand is this, that your life is to be a light. Your life is to be a light. See, in John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy things that we hide, things that are shameful, things that we want to stay in the dark. But it says, I, which is Jesus talking, I have come to give life and have it to the full. And like I said, the best things in life happen during the day. The most life-giving times of your life the times when you eat, the times when you drink, the times when you spend together with friends, generally, the majority of those times will happen in the light. Those are the life-giving times. And this is what Paul's trying to say, that your life is to be a light. Because if you are a follower of Christ, while your life might once have had darkness, it is now to be full of light. It is now to be full of light. As it says, it says, you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of light. Your life is to be a light. Who you are, you are a light. Now, light does an interesting thing when we shine it in certain places. Have you ever noticed that there's certain insects that have different reactions to the light? Have you ever noticed that uh, when you turn the light on in a room, if there's a cockroach around, it tries to find the dark corner. Cockroaches run away from the light. They see it, they don't like it, they run away from it and they go and hide in the dark corners and crannies of your house. You know, they're just like, they're hiding. They don't like the light. But have you noticed that moths, mosquitoes, flies, those sort of things seem to be unable not to go towards it? Did you know that uh, if you have a mozzie in your room or like a moth, God forbid you have a moth in your room, I have a friend who's terrified of moths, that would be their worst nightmare. They're freaky looking things, I get it. But if you have a moth or a mosquito in your room, did you know the best way to get it out is to turn the light off in your room and to turn a light on in the other room? Because they're naturally drawn to the light. Naturally drawn to it. They seek it out. So just so you know, if you ever have that happen again, turn the light off in your room, turn a light on in another room, leave it for a couple of minutes, it will make its way out because it needs to go to where the light is. And the reason I say this is because for us, if we recognise that we are people of light, if we're people who are meant to live a life that shines the light of Jesus around us, then we need to realise that two things are going to happen. The first thing is that your life is going to bring hope to others and others are going to be drawn to it. Because they're going to see it and they're going to see hope, they're going to see purpose, they're going to see value, they're going to see love, they're going to see righteousness, they're going to see truth, they're going to see life and life to the full in your light. And just like the moth, just like the mosquito, they are going to be drawn to it. See, we see this principle happen all the time in movies. You know, someone who's lost in the bush or someone who's lost in the desert, someone who's lost in the snow, people who are lost. And they, they're like, I don't know where to go. I have no hope. I feel like I'm going to die out here. And all of a sudden, they will see a light in the distance. Oh, look, that looks like a person over there. Or there's a lighthouse. Or, you know, look, there's a city. They find this light and all of a sudden there is a hope that is found in it. And when they go to it, they're like, all right, I'm setting out there. Why? Because they know that life is found there. Because they know that there are other people who are going to be able to keep them safe. They know there's other people who are going to be able to give them resources. There are things that they are looking for that they aren't able to find in their lostness, in the desert, in the bush, in, you know, wherever they are, that they can find where that light is. And they know that because they know that other people are there. And so for us, our life, when we truly shine the light of Jesus, is going to be a beacon of hope to some people. There's going to be people who are going to see it and who are going to be drawn to it. You are going to help lead them to a place of life, of purpose, of value, of meaning, of righteousness, of truth. That is what your life is going to do if you will truly be a light to others. It's a pretty cool opportunity. It's 
It's a pretty cool opportunity. I can tell you right now, there's not many better things than hearing someone say how much of a positive influence or how much of a difference you have made in their life. There's really nothing better than that. And that's the opportunity we get to have by living and showing the light of Jesus to others. We actually get the opportunity to influence other people, to lead them to what they're looking for, and for them to be able to say, you made a difference in my life because you were willing to shine your light. So that's the first thing that happens. Your life, uh, your light will bring hope to, to a certain number of people. But there's another truth that your light will expose the darkness and your light will expose the darkness in others. There are going to be people who are going to see your life, who are going to see you trying to follow Jesus, who are going to see the light that comes from your life and they are going to run from it, they're going to hide from it and they are going to also try and extinguish it. Because what happens is how you live your life challenges how they live theirs. And just a really simple example can be this whole idea. Sometimes you can be in a group of friends, you can hear someone talking terribly about another person behind their back and you decide, you know what, I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm going to stand up for that person and just say, no, hey, that's not very fair to say that about them. There are going to be people who are really frustrated and angry at you for doing that because for them, this is something that they like to do. This is something that they think is okay. And when you make a stand for it, you challenge how they're living their life. And so there's going to be people who are not going to want to be a part of it. They're going to disengage. And there's going to be people who are going to try and overwhelm you with their life. Like, and this is true. I remember, I've been through high school. I remember being 14 years old. I was a pastor's kid. I, do, I didn't swear at all. Just wouldn't do it. Wouldn't say a swear word. You know, like, nah, never going to do it. Not even the ones that are kind of like, you're like, mm, are they, aren't they? You know, like, I was like, no, nah, not doing any of that sort of stuff. So what would happen at recess and lunchtime? My friends would try and pressure me to just say a swear word. They'd be like, come on, Ben, just say it. It's not a big deal. Say a swear word. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. You won't do it. You're scared. Say it. Go on. Do it. Just like this. And then they'd say it. I'd be like, I'm not doing it. No, nah, come on. Do it. Do it. Do it. 15, 20 minutes, recess and lunchtime. They're basically just trying to get me to say a swear word. Because how I was living my life was different. There was something about it that was challenging how they lived theirs. And so they either wanted me to go away or to conform to how they were living so they didn't have to be challenged by it anymore. See, your light will expose the darkness. And some people won't like it. And this is an important thing for you guys to understand as teenagers and as Christians trying to live that out in your school, in your part-time job, in your hobby group, whatever that is, it is going to be difficult sometimes. And there's going to be people who don't like how you live your life. But the truth is, there's going to be people who don't like how you live your life, whether you're a Christian, a non-Christian, a Buddhist, however. The truth is, people are not going to like you. They're not all going to like who you are. So stop trying to fit in. Stop trying to have every single person like who you are because it's not achievable. As Grace said the other week, if you try and live for everyone else, then you just lose touch with who you really are. And there's nothing worse than that. But the other important thing for you to understand is that while people might try and, you know, overwhelm your light with their life, they might be like, you know what, I'm just trying to do this, I'm trying to do that. And don't hear me like that all of these people are terrible people. Don't hear that. I'm not saying that Christians are all perfect and all these other people are terrible people who are just going to corrupt you and make you terrible people. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm saying is there's certain things that as Christians we are called to do, that we are asked to live a certain way that is going to challenge how other people do it. There's certain things that, that God asks us to do. You know, it's little things like, you know, we get asked by God to not have sex before marriage, that, you know, that for him they're not separable. They're the same thing. Sex is marriage when we have sex we make that covenant commitment to one another it's to fulfill that role and so when God asks us to do that we're going to challenge what other people are doing with their sexuality and their sexual expression that's how it's going to work it doesn't mean they're terrible people it doesn't mean they're trying to corrupt you and all that it just means that you need to be aware that these dynamics are at play But what's going to happen sometimes is there will be people who will literally try and just do whatever they can to turn your light off. And when you're most susceptible to this is when you feel like you're alone. 
when you feel like you're the only Christian in that group, you're the only Christian at your part-time job, you're the only Christian at your school, you're the only Christian in that hobby group, when you feel like you're all alone, that's when you feel most susceptible to just being completely overwhelmed by what's going on around you. Why not compromise? Why not give in? I'll fit in. This will make things make sense. I would be a part of the group if I do this. These are the moments that we feel like maybe now is the time to compromise. Because let's be real, when we're here right now, it's kind of easy. It feels like it's okay because it's acceptable. It's kind of what's going on here. People are encouraging you to pray for each other. People want you to pray for each other. People ask you to pray for them. You know, like all of these different things are supported in this environment. But when you go to those other places, it feels overwhelming. But you know what's really cool? If I turn the light on on my phone, right, like it's on, you can see it, and it feels pretty good. I can see all your faces pretty easy with all of these lights on. But if we just like slowly turn the lights down, just go for it. Turn the lights down. Slowly turn the lights down. Do you know what's happening to my phone? It's not getting brighter. It's standing out. And you know what's really cool is I can genuinely use this to see you guys, to see each and every single one of you. And so while you might be in an environment where you feel like the darkness is overwhelming. And see, this is a great example of what's happening. See, people do silly things because they feel like I can't see them. Literally. Literally. Because you feel like now you can get away with it. See, literally like how you're embodying my message, I love that. But when you're feeling overwhelmed, your light is not less, in fact it stands out more. And you know what the really cool thing is? None of you can make this light stop shining. None of you. Not a single one of you can make this light stop shining. But you know what I can do? I can intentionally make the decision to turn it off. And what I want you guys to understand in this is that this is the exact same decision that each and every single one of you have too. In any environment you are in, no matter whether you feel like you've got all of this lit up behind you or you feel like you're the only light, you have the decision to either turn your light off or to turn your light back on. Now we're going to turn the lights back on again. Thanks, guys. So I hope you understand just that very simple principle, that actually when you feel most overwhelmed by what's going on around you, when you feel like you're the only one who is living in the light, who is trying to live with the light of Christ, that is when you are actually at your brightest. Did you know that in church history... The church grows the quickest when it is the most oppressed. Do you know why? Because you have to be serious about it. You can't just be like, oh, it's a nice thing to do. Because it's like, no, other people are dying because they go to church. And it's interesting, isn't it? That's when it seems the darkest. And yet that's when the church grows the most. Because that's when its light stands out. That's when its light seems the brightest. And so for you, I just want you all to know that you are people who were made to live in the light. Whether you're a Christian or not, you were designed by God to live in the light, to live in truth, to live in righteousness, to live in relationship with him. That is what the light offers, the fullness of life. That is what God wants. That's how you were designed to live. But we're going to live and be in environments where there is a sense of darkness, where there's things that aren't life-giving, where there's things that are going to try and steal our joy, our peace, our hope, the fullness of life that is available to us. But each and every single one of you have the opportunity to be a light to the people there and to know that some people are going to be drawn to what you have to offer because your light is bringing hope to them. But also understand that sometimes you're going to face some opposition. Sometimes you're going to have people who are going to leave you because your light exposes and challenges their life. And so what I want to do as we finish up, I'm just going to invite the band to come on up now, is we're just going to pray. But what I want you to think about is And I just ask God, God, is there something I can do today? Is there something I can do this week that will shine your light a little bit more clearly? Whether it's school, 
whether at home, whether at your part-time job, whether in your hobby groups, like whatever it is, is there something I can do to shine your light a little bit brighter this week? So would, we, would you join with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for each person here. Lord, I want to thank you for the joy and the hope and the peace that we can find in you and the light that we can live in. The fact that you want to show us how to live our lives as clearly as possible. And Lord, I pray right now for each of us that if there's a little bit of darkness in our life that we just feel like we're carrying, Lord, I pray that you would just bring your light into it. But Lord, I also pray for each of us. I pray that we would recognize that we have your light within us. And Lord, that we can go and shine that light wherever we go. And God, I pray that we would always remember that our light will bring hope to some and it will cause others to hide. But Lord, our job is to just shine the light. And I pray that you would remind us that even when it seems the darkest, that is when our light stands out the brightest. And so Lord, I pray that each of us remember all of these things. And God, I pray that you would help us to go and shine your light a little bit more brightly in some way this week. Lord, help us to know that. In your name we pray. Amen.